You only need one condition to be true in order for something to move in a circle. Let's say that I'm swinging a conker around my head and I have my piece of string going towards me in the middle there. Let's say that the conker's velocity, V, is going that way as it's uh, in front of me there. Now, I want to change the direction that it's going in. I don't want to change its speed at all. I just want to change its direction. You should remember from Newton's second law that if you have a resultant force, you have acceleration as well. But acceleration doesn't have to mean change in speed because change in velocity can mean change in speed or change in direction because velocity is made up of both of those. The only way that I can apply a force in order to make sure that this conquer doesn't speed up or slow down is towards me. I could push out uh, and that would have the same effect, but of course I've just got my piece of string here. So we're gonna forget about that. They're at 90 degrees to each other. They're at right angles to each other there. Let's go a split second into the future and my conquer is now here. Is its velocity going the same way that it was? No, because I have pulled sideways on it, 90 degrees to the velocity, and I've changed the direction of its velocity. It's still going the same speed, just in a different direction. If I pull with the same force downwards like so now, if I pull downwards on this conker now, then I'm gonna be pulling a little bit in the same direction as the velocity, which means it's actually going to speed up. And that's not what I want at all. Again, the only thing that I can do is pull 90 degrees to its velocity. And this will carry on all the way round until it forms a circle around me. So the only condition that you need for circular motion is this. Force is constantly acting at 90 degrees to the object's velocity towards the center of the circle. And that goes for any sort of circular motion that you have at all. That could be a satellite going around the Earth where the satellite's weight and the force of gravity is actually pulling towards the center of the Earth at all times, obviously. As a car goes round the roundabout, the friction between the tires and the road, that's also acting towards the center of the roundabout at all times. We call this force centripetal force. Now you might hear it called a centripetal force, but uh, hey, I'm British, I call it the centripetal force. A centripetal force is one that is always acting towards the center of the circle. Now you might hear uh, centrifugal force. Centrifugal force is a bit of a weird one. It's the sort of fake force that you think you're feeling as you're being pushed out um, say if you're on a roundabout you feel like you're being pushed out of the car but in fact all you're feeling is the centripetal force pushing you in towards the center of the circle so there's no real such thing as the centrifugal force now there is an equal and opposite reaction force in any situation of course um, you could call that the centrifugal force but we don't you can see that the force is always 90 degrees to the velocity so we could say the velocity is always at a tangent or tangential to the object's path. In other words, it's always at a tangent to the circle. We can see that there. Put a ruler there, that's on a tangent, that's the velocity, and there, and there, you get the idea. What would happen if my string snapped all of a sudden so there's no more tension? Uh, there's no more centrifugal force. Some people think that the conker would actually fly out in this direction. That's not true at all, is it? Because that means that we're creating a velocity out of nowhere. The conker at this point is going this way. So if the string snapped right then, then my conker would fly off in that direction. Things always fly off at a tangent if the centripetal force is all of a sudden removed. So with a bit of help from Planet Coaster, let's see what this looks like in reality or not quite reality, but you get what I mean. 
So we have a thrill right here and each of these capsules is undergoing circular motion and is constantly accelerating towards the center. Let's put on the arrow showing the centripetal force for one of these capsules. Now the centripetal force here would be the tension in the metal bar that is connecting it to the hub. We also see this with the chair swing ride. When the people in their chairs get flung outwards, they would go flying off at a tangent, but the tension in the wires keeps them accelerating towards the center, but not getting any closer. So that makes them go in a circle. Now on a loop the loop on a roller coaster, the centripetal force is the support force exerted on the cars towards the center of the loop. Using only half a loop, we can demonstrate what happens when the centripetal force is suddenly removed. The centripetal force is there as it goes round the circle, and then at the top, the velocity is going to the left, and the centripetal force is removed because it runs out of track, and therefore it no longer accelerates towards the center and just flies off to the left. So that's where the GCSE ends pretty much. Let's have a look at some A-lovely stuff. There's our object going in a circle. Let's go around this way here. And the force, as per usual, is acting towards the center here. There's its velocity at that point in time. Now, in order to be a circle, that means that the object has to be the same distance away from the center at all times, and it's at a distance r. That's the radius. So we know that it has a speed v. It's r away from the center of the circle and we have a force f. Now we know that the object is constantly accelerating towards the center of the circle because that's the way that the force is pulling. That has to be true. If the force is pulling towards, if a force is pulling in a certain direction, that's the way the acceleration has to be going as well. But what's weird is that it's not getting any closer to the center of the circle. So a satellite going around the earth is constantly accelerating towards the center of the earth, but it's not getting any closer kind of weird. The acceleration that something experiences going around in a circle is equals to V squared over R. That's velocity squared over R. The units work out and we end up with meters per second squared. Putting this into F equals MA, we end up with F equals MV squared over R. And that's the main equation that you're going to be using for circular motion. Now, later on in gravitational fields and magnetic fields and electric fields, you're going to be equating this force to other forces as well. So you're going to be using this equation a lot, uh, especially probably in the second year of your A-level. So this force could be the tension in a string that's uh, making something fly around in a circle, or it could be equals to an object's weight if it's going around in an orbit around the Earth or it could be equals to friction, or it could, like I said, be equals to a uh, force due to an electric field or a magnetic field as well. What can we do with this then? Well, you're usually given the mass of an object and you're probably given the radius as well. Well, you might be asked to figure that out. A lot of the time you're not given the speed, but instead you're given the time that it takes for an object to go round in a full circle. And we know that a time period is the time it takes for anything to complete a full cycle, and we call that T, that's seconds, so it's a capital T, not a little t. Don't forget as well that frequency is one over the time period and vice versa as well. So you could be given the frequency and you have to use that instead. We'll use this in a second though. Something speed is equals to distance over time. And the time that we're talking about is the time period here, and we have a full circle. So what's that going to be? 2 pi r over t. And using frequency instead, we get 2 pi f r. This is where we introduce something new. 2 pi f has its own special symbol. And that's an omega, sort of like a curly Greek w. This is called angular velocity or angular speed and we measure it in radians per second. Why? Because we have two pi, that's the amount of radians in a full circle, times f, which is frequency, which is hertz, but that's per seconds as well, s to the minus one. So angular velocity is just telling us how many radians per second an object is doing. So we can see that v equals omega r, 
or Omega, depending on how you say it. Omega is also going to crop up in simple harmonic motion as well, so it's worth getting your head around. Now let's consider a satellite going around the Earth, a geostationary satellite. Here's the path that the satellite is taking. Now if I ask you to draw where the radius is, uh, you might be tempted to draw on here an arrow going from the surface, but of course with circular motion, the radius has to go from the center of the circle, so that's the center of the Earth. Now what do we know about a satellite that's in a geostationary orbit? We know that it's above the same point on the uh, surface, and that has to be above the equator, obviously because if it's anywhere else it's not going to go in a perfect circle around the Earth. So we know that the time period for this to do one complete orbit of the Earth is 24 hours because it's following the Earth's rotation. Times up by 3600, that's the number of seconds in an hour, and we get 86,400 seconds. The radius of this orbit, I can tell you, is 4.2 times 10 to the 7 meters. That's 42,000 kilometers. That's from the center of the Earth. And the mass of this satellite is 50 kilograms. Now what if I ask, what is the centripetal force felt by this satellite at any given time? We know from earlier that F is mv squared over r. Now we have m, we have r, we don't have v. In order to find out v, we could do the whole 2 pi r divided by the time period, and that gives us a speed of 3.05 times 10 to the 3 meters per second. And then we could pop that back into there and we could find the force that way. We could do that, but you might notice that there is a bit of a shortcut. Because we know that V is omega r, we can pop that back into here. And we actually end up with F equals m omega squared r. So in fact, we do not need to know how fast the satellite is going. We don't need to know its actual speed. All we need to know is its angular velocity. And in order to find that out, just do m 2 pi over t squared times r. Omega is 2 pi f. That's also the same as 2 pi over the time period. So square that. This is 50 times 2 pi divided by 86,400 squared times the radius, which is 4.2 times 10 to the 7. And that gives us a force of 11.1 newtons. That's how big our centripetal force actually is. What about if we've got a plane and it's coming towards you and what it's doing is that it's banking. In other words, it's going in a circle. It's not yawing at all. All it's doing is pulling upwards, as it were, at an angle. So it's going in a circle like this and uh, that's the radius of its path as it goes in a circle. And we know that if it's pulling up, then it must be providing a force in this direction here, perpendicular to the wings. And let's say that we know this angle here to be theta. If it's going in a flat circle as well, we also know that whatever component that we have going vertically must be equals to mg. Finally, we know that this component, the horizontal component of this force must be equals to mv squared over r because that's the force needed for circular motion. By the way, this works for a car going around a banked track as well. It's just that the force isn't up thrust, it's just the reaction force from the track. So what do we know this force to be? Well, we know if we have this angle here, then to find out what the resultant is, we're not turning through the angle. So we're gonna use sine. If you haven't seen my easy vectors trick video, then have a look at that. So we can say that 
this force is going to be equals to mg divided by, because you know it's going to be bigger, by sine theta. Turn away from your sin, turn away from your sine. So that's how we can find the resultant force from the weight. We also know that the force can be calculated using this centripetal force as well. It's going to be mv squared over r divided by cos theta because we're turning through the angle in this case. If the force can be calculated using the weight and it can be calculated using the centripetal force, then we can actually equate these two things together. More often than not, you'll just have to rearrange this to find then the radius of the plane's circular path or the speed that it's traveling at. See if you can have a go at rearranging to find the speed. Pause the video if you want to go with that. We know that the m's disappear there because we've got m on both sides. What we can also do is take sine theta over to the other side here. And we end up with g equals v squared over r times, now we have sine theta divided by cos theta. You might know from mass that actually gives us tan theta. Finally, if you want to get speed from this, all we have to do is rearrange this and we end up with v squared over r equals g divided by tan theta. Finally, taking the r to the other side and square rooting it, we end up with the square root of gr over tan theta. So square root of the whole thing there. Let's go back to our loop the loop. So here's the track coming in. Now let's have a think about what the support force is from the track at each point as the car is going round. So we have it here, here, and here at the top. Not too concerned about this side because it's going to be exactly the same as this side. Now let's just have a think about this bit here first of all. Whatever the support force, I'm going to call it S, of the track has to be, we know that weight is pulling downwards so we don't really care about that because the support force is going towards the middle. The support force is only needed to provide the centripetal force. So we can say S equals mv squared over r at that point. However, what about here? Here we have a support force as well, but the support force also has to hold the car up. So more support is needed for the weight. So in this case, the support force is going to be mv squared over r, but also it has to counteract the weight as well. What about up here? Well, this time weight is pulling down, so it's almost like weight is actually contributing to the centripetal force. So actually, less support force is needed at the top because weight helps. So that means that S, in this case, again, is providing the force for circular motion, so that's mv squared over r, but this time the weight is actually helping. So we can take off mg. So when it comes to any question like this with vertical circular motion and weight is involved, just think, is weight helping or is it hindering? If it's hindering, then the support force needs to be greater. If weight is helping the centripetal force, as it were, then we can take it away from the support force. So I hope you found this useful. If you did, leave a like, leave a comment down below if you think I've missed anything or you have a question. And I'll see you next time.